My name is Milton 510 Bowens. I am a fine artist. I am originally from Oakland, California, but I am currently working and living in Moulton, Alabama. I am the co-owner of Gallery 157 that is located in Moulton, Alabama. And today I'm gonna show you how I do collage with a combination of text. So some people might call it assemblage. Some people might call it narrative work. I like to just call it being creative with pictures and words. So the first thing that I do when I start my process is once I've, once I've looked at my journal and I've identified the icon that I'm going to be using and I've matched it with the background, then I pull the actual icon, which is basically printed on just a normal black and white Xerox copy. Um, I spent a lot of time at the copy shop uh, because it's important. And my process in terms of this part of the collage, I'm looking for elements with contrast. And there's a reason for it. Um, my, my, my work is heavily influenced by the documentary filmmaker, Ken Burns. And Ken Burns deals a lot with black and white imagery within his documentaries. And the black and white imagery, they, they basically serve as the historical reference. And I find that very intriguing. So when you're watching one of his documentary films, you'll notice that when he's dealing with history, it's all in black and white. And then when he's dealing with like a historian or he's dealing with somebody, a survivor or someone's being interviewed, a scholar, they're in that bright color. So I kind of use those aspects at work for myself because I use the black and white imagery because it gives me just that old historical, you know, footage feel. And so when I start, I take the Xerox copy and I basically am just trying to get nice, clean cuts of whatever image that it is. Now, if you notice, I don't necessarily use my scissors in a traditional way. I don't try to use my scissors. I actually just guide my scissors. I let my scissors do the majority of the work. Notice that I don't actually move my hand. I kind of hold the scissors in a stable position, like a position that I'm comfortable with. And then from that position, I just actually turn the paper. So the paper actually does the majority of the work in the process because you can find yourself, uh, you know, allowing the scissors to take it, you know, to, to, to just intimidate you. And there's no reason to be intimidated with any of the materials that you're using. What you're looking for is you're trying to find a comfort zone. You're trying to find what works best for you. And what I found that works best is that if I, if I actually move the paper and just let the scissors maintain a certain position that I don't get a bunch of overcuts. Now, this works beautifully when you're working on cutting the perimeters of anything, but sometimes if you would have to go inside the composition of, of, of a picture, that would be the only time that I wouldn't use scissors and I would have to go to my X-Acto knife. But, but, but typically, if I'm just working with cutting the perimeters of my images, I like to use you know, a good pair of sharp scissors, but I basically try to hold these scissors as firmly as possible and in one position and then actually rotate the paper. And then that gives me a better sense of control and I can actually watch the entire thing as I go through that process. So once you have your copies and some of your embellishments already set to go, you're starting to build the framework of the composition. You're trying to see, you know, what is the viewer going to see and what do you want in the frame? What do you want in that composition? And it's much like if you were, you know, shooting a, a photograph, you're trying to make sure everything fits inside the frame uh, before you actually snap that picture. So when I'm looking at this particular image, I'm noticing that there's something in my copy that I need to remove so the background will show through and it'll help just give me the appearance like she's there intentionally and not an afterthought. 
And, and those little things are important. Now notice for this cutting process, I had to go to my X-Acto and not use my scissors, obviously because there's no way to get your scissors in the middle of your cutout. But that little bit is going to actually now show through to the canvas. And it might not like seem like a, a big deal or a lot, but actually it's those little things for an artist that overall when the piece is done, it, it, it just kind of makes everything work in harmony with foreground, background, and middle ground. So now like on this particular one, we're, in, we're introducing the organic paper. So in introducing this, you know, you want to take the same process. You want to try to make sure everything is there. So, you know, if I wanted to use the whole image, I could, but then I'm going to create a bunch of negative space on the left side of her uh, of her portrait, which necessarily, I mean, if I had something that I had thought out in advance that was going to go here, then I would make that artistic decision. But not having anything in mind that goes there, I actually just reduce that amount of the negative space to kind of create this off-centered effect because I do want these flowers. These flowers are gonna play an important part with, with the text. Um, Ida B. Wells uh, was a, a very, very powerful activist and journalist. Um, and she documented the lynchings that took place in the South. And so these roses are going to depict um, metaphorically, like when, when you lose a loved one and, and, and you, place, you place flowers down in remembrance. That, that, that's the role that these flowers are gonna play in this particular composition. But now notice with just those two simple cuts, we brought everything into the correct framework. And now this one is ready to actually glue. So once you've created your composition and you know it's ready to go, it, it's the way you want to see it. Um, now we go to the gluing process. Now, th this is a lot of times um, where every collage artist has a different approach. My approach is simple. I don't like to work with glues because, you know, glues are starch based. And once glues dry and starch hardens, over time it has the ability to crack. I like to work with acrylic based um, adhesives. And so I like to use mediums. So what I do is I actually take my images and I move them. And if sometimes if you need, you know, a marker so you know where things go, it's easy to just take a pencil or take something and just make a mark to identify where things go, but never put a mark inside the composition that the viewer is gonna see. Always make sure your marks are gonna be hidden with something that can cover them up, but you wanna make sure you keep things where they're supposed to go, because once you get past three or four things in your collage, it can get kind of confusing when you get to the gluing process. So I remove this. Now, I take it directly off of the canvas onto my scratch board. Scratch boards are very important, and I'm gonna explain to you why. One of my secrets for keeping my artwork as clean as I do is that the majority of the stuff that I'm using to adhere my images to the canvas actually stays over here. And that's how I can get a clean process over here. Now, sometimes I will intentionally paint over just to give the whole co composition continuity. And you'll see, I'm getting ready to show you all of this, what I'm explaining right now. So I start with this process. We take our adhesive or our adhering compound or acrylic medium and we basically coat the back of our surface evenly. And you don't have to be stingy with it. You can be generous with it because you wanna make sure that you put enough down so it sticks to your surface the first time. You don't wanna get in the process of trying to peel things up once you've attached it down onto the surface. That could become disastrous. So once you got it evenly done, you pick it up, you find your placement, you apply it. 
Now, once it's applied, and notice I'm using a pallet knife, not a roller or a burnisher. I'm going to take some of the extra adhesive off of my scratch board and use it so I can smoothly press down because the top surface of your paper is going to be dry. And you can actually, if you are pressing too hard, you can actually rip, buckle, or cut the paper that you're trying to attach down to your surface. So notice that I'll keep the surface of my collage wet with my adhering medium so I don't scratch, rip, or buckle the surface of my collage. But this is also gonna add a protective coating on top of it as well too. Boom, nice and flat, no air bubbles. Now, there's, you don't, depending on how large the surface is you're working on, this is a very small canvas, so I don't have to give this any drying time. If you're working on a bigger collage, you might wanna let this step dry before you go to your second step, which is your second piece that you're gonna apply. But this surface is so small, I don't have to wait. So I'm gonna lay this down. Now notice that I'm using a brush to apply this one, because this is my portrait. And I just wanna make sure that the glue is even on this one, because making sure you don't have any air bubbles on the portraits are very important. Once you get your place. Making sure that there are no air bubbles. Now, I take my brush and I go over the composition. Just to make sure I got a smooth, even protective coat along Once that dry, you'd be good to go, like the other ones that are sitting over there waiting for their writing. So once you have successfully um, adhered all of your elements of collage, you always want to do a, a touch test to make sure that your surface is dry and ready for your text application. Now, the one thing about applying text is I always work from my journal or sketch pad. So I already have mapped out the text that I want to go on the painting. And I've already made sure that in the journal that it's spell checked and everything is, you know, written correctly. But you still have to play with uh, positioning um, because you're trying to treat the text no differently than you treated your collage imagery to make sure you still get a cohesive balance in the overall composition. So, um, so the first thing I know I want to do is I want to immortalize her with my crown that I use when I'm dealing with certain icons. I like, I want to elevate their status to this uh, status of royalty. Um, so we use the crown, which, uh, actually comes from graffiti, but is more commonly known and was used widely by a very famous artist who inspires my career, which is John Michel Basquiat. So it's a double tribute. It takes me back to my original origins of doing graffiti, but it also pays tribute uh, to one of the greatest, you know, commercial fine artists that we've 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 ever had, which is Jean-Michel Basquiat. So that's probably the point of where I start. 
and then I let every the rest of the composition build out from there. So this is Dolores Warta, and I'm I'm I know that I'm going to try to get the images in here. Uh, she is the co-founder of the United Farm Workers Union alongside Cesar Chavez. Now, a lot of people know the story of Cesar Chavez, but they they you you don't commonly hear. Uh, Dolores' story told as much, but she was an integral part and co-founder of the United Farm Workers. Um, so that's that's where I'm going to start. So um, I like to use paint markers, but I also use pastel and um, an oil crayon. But uh, for these, I, I, you know, this is basically acrylic paint in a, in a pen. Um, and I like it because it's opaque, which means it's not, you can't really see through it, but sometimes you have to do more than one coat, but you treat it no different than regular paint. You put your first coat down, let it dry, then you, then you go over it, you know, to make things darker. So this is where I'm going to start it. So I get my crown in, then I'm gonna come next to the crown and I'm gonna put a little trademark. Because I didn't come up with it. <laughs> so from here, since we have that on that part of the composition and I want that to actually dry, I'm gonna sit that there and then I'm going to determine what other elements I want in here. Now I know I want this UFW somewhere and I gotta get um, 10 tally marks in here. So what I'm gonna do is I think I'm gonna add my tally marks here and then get the UFW underneath my tally marks. Or I might put the UFW on top with the 10 tally marks on the bottom because then metaphorically it'll speak to the United Farm Workers Union having to do this over and over multiple times, you know, it's like there's never an end to the struggle. So the tally marks represents, this is just 10 times in the struggle, but the struggle doesn't end. So I think I'm going to go in the reverse. I think I'm going to put my UFW and then add my 10 tally marks. And then the last word I'm going to put on here is Heliga. Well, you know, research is Spanish and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So let me add um, the UFW and the tally marks, which I know are going to be two different two different colors. So the first thing I'm going to go with is the UFW. So we get the United Farm Workers in here. Then I'm going to come back in a different color and I'm gonna do my tallies. I love using tally marks in my work for two reasons. It's the oldest symbol of recording time. Um, and it has a wide range of use metaphorically. I, I, I love using tally marks. So now, final thing is my signature word. Dolores Warta, unsung hero. So I hope you enjoyed this time with me in my studio today. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to be uh, involved in a project like Unsung Heroes. Uh, I would encourage everybody to just you know find your own creative voice. Uh, 
Try to apply and use the variety of techniques that you'll see uh, throughout this series of amazing artists who are trying to, you know, ex show you how they use creativity to express their interests, their likes, and find your own unsung heroes. Uh, you know, the thing about this project, the beauty of this project is that we all have different people who inspire us, different people who we look up to. So find those people that inspire you and then elevate them, you know, uh, and like I said, um, you know, let creativity guide you and just have fun. <laughs>